छत्रपति शिवाजी संत तुकाराम एंड साहब ज्ञानेश्वर महात्मा फुले एंड सावित्री बाई फुले स्कॉलर्स लाइक भंडारकर पराजपी एंड गोसंबी एंड सिंगर्स लाइक भारत रत्न पंडित भीमसेन जोशी एंड डॉक्टर बाबा देयर कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू सोसाइटी थ्रू थॉट लर्निंग एंड एक्शन हैज बीन टाइमलेस एंड इट इज दिस स्पिरिट दैट पुणे इंटरनेशनल सेंटर सीक्स टू इम्बाइव एंड टेक इन टू द फ्यूचर we are grateful to all our founders trustees members and associates for creating this institution in the words of dr marshalkar which echo the spirit of all our members pic is a vichar mankan kendra a think tank with a churning of ideas and action the word action <coughs> is very important to us friends i would now like to introduce the dignitaries of the day Our chief guest today is Justice Madan Imrao Roko, who will shortly deliver the 12th Pune International Centre Foundation Day lecture titled "Rise and Shine: Judiciary and Transforming Justice Day." Justice Roko is a judge of the Supreme Court of Fiji and a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. He was appointed judge of the Supreme Court of India in June 2012. and retired in december 2018 he has served as chief justice of andhra pradesh high court and guwahati high court and was a judge of the delhi high court he was a member of the supreme court mediation and conciliation project committee since its inception and was later its chairperson he headed the e committee of the supreme court for the computerization of all the courts in india as a one man committee he was asked to suggest improvements in the working of the homes and organizations under the juvenile justice act justice lokur writes frequently on legal issues and pursues his interests in various activities including child rights legal aid and judicial education he speaks to the media on current issues from time to time He was public lectures on issues related to the judiciary, and this is a voice of conscience. Thank you, sir, for your presence here today. <laughs> Dr. Vijay Kerkar, Padma Vibhushan, and Vice President PIC, was the chairman of the 13th Finance Commission of India. He was executive director at the International Monetary Fund. and has served as petroleum secretary and finance secretary in the government of india the chair for today's event dr ragunath marshalkar padma vibhushan is president pune international center he is a fellow of the royal society formerly national research professor and a former director general of csir Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. May I now request Dr. Mashilka to please give his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, our uh, respected uh, Justice. Uh, Madam Lokur Ji, our Wait. chief guest uh, for the function, our foundation day lecturer, uh, Mrs. Uh, Savita Lokur, and members of uh, Lokur family, we are very happy to have you here today. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kerkar, our most uh, beloved uh, vice president, most respected vice president, Mr. Abhay Vidya, all the PIC family members. Yes, we are one family. Uh, I see lots of uh, young children who participated uh, with us earlier in our uh, competition. All of you, distinguished uh, invitees, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, to start with, uh, I must say 
it's a wonderful feeling to be in Yashoda and uh, meeting in the real world, the physical world. Uh, you know, giving warm handshakes. Uh, I think uh, something that we've forgotten for a couple of years. And it's a great feeling, I can tell you, in, in terms of meeting you all. So, welcome. Uh, Abhay has introduced uh, formerly uh, Justice uh, Lokul, but I must tell him that I've been a great admirer of Justice Lokul, not because of the top positions he occupied, rightly so. Justice are judged by the judgments that they did, landmark judgments that they did. And it is incredible. Uh, he has, I was just telling him, his uh, uh, career personified. Sir, I remember uh, in May 2012, the Indian High Court, uh, comprising yourself, struck down the government of India's uh, uh, decision on 4.5% sub quota. And you straight away said the sub quota was based on religion and not any other intelligible decision. Alright? Those were days when we used to strike down on the government today. At Chief Justice and NT High Court, Justice Loku suspended uh, Special CBI Judge uh, T. Uh, Patabiram Rao and ordered his prosecution in a mining scam case uh, relating to the Reddy business. I'm just giving you two examples. Just to illustrate the individual who is uh, sort of occupying uh, uh, this seat today with us. So, my friends, uh, we have uh, as Foundation Day speaker, as someone who is exemplar, who is an icon, who is a role model. To me, he is a lighthouse in the dark nights that we have today. We require light you know, uh, uh, of uh, uh, enlightenment uh, in, in these uh, difficult uh, times, particularly when trust deficit has become a challenge for the country. It's not the budget deficit, trust deficit in some way or the other. And I think that is where, sir, you stand uh, tall and inspire us. Uh, so thank you for doing us the honor. Uh, I want to make an announcement. As you know, Pune International Center has members, but there is a very special category called honorary members, uh, which is given very rarely. All the Bharat Ratnas have had, uh, we have had uh, them as uh, uh, our uh, uh, honorary members. Uh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam was an honorary member, he is no more. Lata Mangeshkar was a honorary member. We paid her a tribute, special tribute, she is no more. Sachin Tendulkar is an uh, honorary member. And earlier, uh, about a week ago, uh, Prabhat Pre, you know the great Prabhat Pre, we uh, uh, requested her to be an honorary member, she accepted. And just today, Today we uh, invited uh, and requested uh, uh, Justice Loko to be our honorary member, and I'm very happy to say that they have accepted to be the one. So, uh, you are always in our mind, now you are one of us. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of the uh, family. A few words about uh, PIC, uh, as it's conventional, you know, as you know, PIC was founded on 24 uh, uh, December 2011. Uh, sorry, September 2011. So this is the 12th uh, Foundation Day. And uh, we can look back uh, with great pride in terms of what we have achieved. Sense of satisfaction, sense of pride, <coughs> what we have uh, achieved. Uh, I'm very happy Latika is here and uh, we remember Dilip always on this day, Dilip Paragalkar. He used to say that Pune International Center is international center in Pune, by the way. <laughs> and we are creating a big international uh, footprint. Uh, you know, we have this Asia Economic Dialogue. Uh, we have three of them. And the last one, 
I believe we had uh, speakers from 16 countries and 25 nations, as a matter of fact, were watching our event. And it has grown to such an extent that uh, some of our good friends are calling it uh, the Devos of the East. And we are very, very proud uh, that uh, this is an international footprint we have created. We created this Ambassador Speak series. And uh, this was, of course, uh, Dr. Vijay Kedkar's brainchild. Most of the new programs that we hear, which are game changing, <laughs> which will be different, they all come from him. He's a great thought leader. We are very, very lucky to have having him as our vice president. And in this, again, uh, you know, the participation by the ambassadors, whether it is uh, <coughs> South Korea, Bangladesh, and so many other uh, countries, we get uh, the perspective, a global geopolitical perspective, for example. We also get to know what they think about India and so on and so forth. That, again, uh, has a global character. Uh, recently, we signed an agreement uh, with uh, what is probably uh, considered as the best uh, think tank in Latin America, uh, the uh, Brazilian Center in International uh, Relations, and uh, so on. So I can go on just to <coughs> say how we are creating a big international footprint. The number of flagship programs that we have, one of them is Pune Dialogue on National Security, uh, which is uh, always held in the Chatham House uh, by following Chatham House rules. And we have had six of them so far dealing with critical issues of national security and the deliberations and recommendations finally are uh, sent to the highest <coughs> level uh, in national leadership who deal with uh, uh, security and they held it in very uh, high esteem. On the other hand, as uh, Anil rightly said, our feet are on the ground. We worry about India, we worry about Pune, we worry about our rural villages. So our program, flagship program on national conference on social innovation, uh, this was the first conference on social innovation in the country. This is the 10th year, 17 November, we have it, actually. And uh, this is, uh, again, a grand success. The kind of uh, social entrepreneurship promotion that this program does and the mentorship uh, uh, program that we have as well as the shared service uh, uh, center for uh, social entrepreneurs that we have you know, huge, huge uh, uh, success. And the same thing about uh, environment and other areas. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, some of these. Uh, we constantly remind ourselves that uh, PIC is established as an independent, multifaceted policy research uh, think tank. And uh, once again, we have our uh, of policy research in India, Dr. Vijay Kekar, thanks to him uh, and his leadership, we have had, uh, I think, about a couple of dozen of policy papers on uh, interests uh, to, to India, the critical uh, sort of items. And we also uh, aim uh, to provide a forum for free and fair public debate. Our aim is to provide a forum for uh, uh, liberal intellectuals, basically. All right. We don't believe in monocultures. We believe in multicultures. We propose, uh, we respect other religions. And the same is India, as words uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 India and world's greatest religions uh, is an example of uh, uh, this. I think we have ten so far, ten different religions. And thank you for. Uh, your help in sort of uh, promoting it. The other thing about us, uh, which I'm particularly proud of, is that uh, uh, we, the tropicality of what we do, all right? And uh, there, to borrow General Mehta's words, the three Cs, climate, COVID, and uh, conflict, all right? They are the ones which are uh, creating problems. So for example, if you look at conflict, uh, on August 1, we had a symposium on uh, Ukraine crisis and the challenge for India's foreign policy. Uh, we had a discussion on China, how China sees uh, India and the world and how do we uh, sort of position ourselves. Uh, coming to COVID, there are a large number of aspects of that, but one of them has been the loss of uh, 
uh, learning uh, for our children, for example. So we had a session on recovering learning loss by some of the top educational experts, learning loss because of COVID-19. Uh, climate Conference 2022, for example, again, uh, you know, uh, decade of change, India is the climate challenge, world, etc., etc. So, the main point is that there is no issue that we leave out. In fact, Vijay was looking at the semiconductor, as you know, suddenly there is a movement in Delhi, and I'm very proud that six months ago we had created a paper in terms of what we should do in semiconductor. So we like to be ahead, by the way. All right, to the thought leadership, we've been ahead uh, sort of all this and got followers. I'm very proud. I'm just giving you some examples in terms of uh, uh, the topicality. Uh, last week, we have, of course, PIC 440 members uh, from all sorts of disciplines, by the way, uh, whether it is policy, diplomacy, science and technology, art, journalism, economics. Uh, and so now we have you. NBC is even further because in this category we do not have any uh, membership. Uh, 55 institutional members, uh, 14 corporate uh, members. Uh, we have done some 300 programs, am I right? Uh, uh, aware of uh, all kinds and uh, policy papers, etc. Et uh, our scale and scope continues to increase. Uh, like, for example, uh, we have done a book now, uh, Strategic Patients and uh, flexible policies, how India can uh, rise to the China challenge, for example. And I'm very happy this book is uh, received very, very well uh, where it uh, actually matters. And there's a new book uh, that is coming up on India 2030, uh, some of our thoughts on pathways to uh, success. So I'd like to end uh, with uh, good news. I've given you a lot of good news, by the way, <laughs> more good news. Uh, that is the Maharashtra government has uh, given us now 2.8 hectares of land near Pashan. There will be breeding or abroad for the first time, which is a long time. This took uh, some seven years and three chief ministers, but all chief ministers supported us. No, <laughs> it did not matter uh, which party that they belong to. So we very much hope that soon, just like you are sitting here, we will be having our own auditorium uh, 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 and uh, uh, so many other uh, facilities. I want to thank each one of you for having done what you have done for PIC selflessly. I don't want to take names because that will take a lot of uh, time. Uh, I have this uh, sense that uh, PIC is at your heart and each one of you says, uh, PIC matters to me. How can I matter more to PIC? So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mashekar, for this warm, welcoming words and a great introduction to Pune International Centre. I would now request our honourable chief guest, Justice Madan Loko, to deliver the 12th Foundation Day lecture on Rise and Shine, Judiciary and Transforming Justice Delivery. A big round of applause for our Chief Guest everyone. Thank you, Madam Chief Guest. Good evening and Namaskar to everybody. Dr. Mashaykar, Dr. Kelkar, Mr. Vedya, all the trustees and members of uh, PIC. Uh, it's a great uh, honor uh, of course, it's a pleasure, but it's a great honor for me to be addressing all of you on the 12th Foundation Day Lecture. I have chosen uh, the theme for my lecture as uh, Rise and Shine for the Judiciary and uh, Justice Delivery. Because today, I uh, find that our judiciary has sort of dug itself into a hole. And it can come out of that hole. And that's why it's also, a, in, in a sense, an exhortation to the judiciary to rise and shine, because you can do it. And uh, we need the judiciary to rise and shine. Uh, we need an independent judiciary, and uh, we need a judiciary which gives us good quality judgments and protects our fundamental rights. I think that is very important in any democracy. 
Now, the situation that we are facing today is not something unique. It has happened in the emergency. There are many of us here who were, uh, you know, uh, present during the emergency, but many of the younger ones uh, who are here may have just read about it. Uh, during the emergency, our justice delivery system and our judiciary actually hit rock bottom. And uh, that was primarily because of one judgment. Uh, I will not say the entire judiciary, the high courts did a wonderful job in protecting uh, personal liberty. But the Supreme Court in one judgment of uh, ADM Jabalpur, um, you know, it had a, it, it had a terrible impact on uh, personal liberty. The result was that, uh, you know, personal liberty was almost gone. The authorities could arrest anybody and say that, you know, we are detaining you under MISA and uh, the person would be without a trial uh, until the emergency ended and hundreds, if not thousands of persons uh, had been arrested and placed under MISA. Now, in spite of that, in spite of what happened during the emergency, freedom of speech was gone, personal liberty was gone, freedom of movement was gone. Today, we have a different form of uh, emergency, not an official emergency, but today we have something called the National Security Act, NSA, which is almost the same as uh, MISA. We have the Public Security Act, PSA. We have the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act. All these acts, uh, which are being used, by the way, uh, to detain persons without a trial and they remain in jail for any number of days, if not months. Sedition has also been uh, you know, invoked uh, as a crime against uh, persons for small things. You know, somebody gives a tweet and uh, that person is charged with uh, sedition. Uh, so we have this situation today. But we have something additional which is something like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. So you can have persons who are belonging to the Armed Forces are given some kind of impunity from prosecution. You will remember some time back, um, some persons were killed in Nagaland, uh, laborers. The Armed Forces thought that would be a terrorist, shot them at uh, virtually at point blank range. The people from uh, Nagaland, from that village, protested. Uh, they were also killed. And uh, there, there is a report that seems to have been given by a special investigation team saying that uh, this is nothing but murder, but no action has been taken. The Prevention of Corruption Act has been amended with the result that to prosecute a government servant for corruption is now very difficult because you have to get sanction and the government does not give sanction. So today we are really living in you know very troubled times, but in, during the emergency and after the emergency, the Supreme Court actually started coming back to life, you know, somewhat like a phoenix, and it came out of uh, the problems that it had created for itself. And I hope that uh, today also we are in a position to uh, our judiciary is in a position to come out of the problems that they have created. There are three things that happened after the emergency which gave the Supreme Court back its prestige, which it had lost during the emergency. One is the uh, concept of public interest litigation, or PIL as we call it. The Supreme Court looked into public interest litigation, or PIL, on a variety of issues. Uh, environment, uh, for example, um, governance. <coughs> corruption, uh, looking after the uh, benefits that are available to people. So actually anybody could come and file a public interest litigation and bring to the notice of the Supreme Court that there is a problem and something has to be done about it and the Supreme Court would take it up as a matter affecting the fundamental rights of the people. The second thing which the Supreme Court did, which was in a sense an extension of uh, PIL, was access to justice for marginalized uh, people, those who were downtrodden, uh, those who were underprivileged, to the extent that procedural formalities were given up. 
and even a postcard could be sent to the Supreme Court saying that there is a problem and uh, please look into it because fundamental rights are being violated. People sent letters, socially conscious people sent letters to the Supreme Court which were acted upon. I would like to mention uh, Swami Agnivesh, he had sent a letter to the Supreme Court and the entire issue of bonded labor came to the fore. And thousands of bonded laborers who's, you know, who were under bonded labor, their parents had been under bonded labor, their grandparents had been under bonded labor, and they were all released. We've had the Supreme Court intervening on behalf of mentally ill persons on a petition filed by Sheila Parsi. We've had uh, the Supreme Court acting upon newspaper reports and upon a letter petition with regard to the blinding of alleged criminals by the police in Bhagalpur, where the police thought that these persons are criminals, some of them may have been convicted, but they put acid into the eyes of these persons, they pierced the eyes with needles, and the Supreme Court took it up as a public interest litigation. And I, I, I can give you a very large number of cases. And eventually this concept of access to justice led to the Supreme Court taking it up in such a big way that the Constitution of India was amended. Article 39A was introduced and free legal aid became one of the directive principles of uh, state policy. So people had access to justice. It did not matter whether you had money. It did not matter whether you had a lawyer. You just had to petition the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court would look into it. The third innovation that the Supreme Court had was that of Lok Adalats. Now Lok Adalats over the years, uh, it started off uh, you know, with regard to petty and small cases. It is still continuing with petty and small cases, but over the years, lakhs of such cases have been disposed of. And people could appear in person and tell the Lok Adalat, which was a semi-formal sort of a body, uh, that, you know, I have a problem and uh, the other parties here, hear them out and uh, take a decision. So a very large number of cases have been settled by Lok Adalat over the years. The parliament also enacted the uh, Legal Services Authorities Act and Lok Adalats have now been institutionalized. These three uh, developments that took place, public interest litigation, access to justice and Lok Adalat, redeemed the honor and prestige of the Supreme Court to the extent that the Supreme Court began to be described as the people's court. Right? I do not know of any other court anywhere in the world where the court can be called the people's court. Earlier, prior to the emergency in 1973, the Supreme Court had uh, developed the doctrine of basic structure. You can amend the constitution they said in uh, Keshwanand Dharati's case, you can amend the constitution, but you cannot change the basic structure of the constitution. So you cannot destroy free and fair elections, for example. You cannot destroy the independence of the judiciary. You cannot destroy the secular uh, fabric of our uh, country. You cannot destroy the rule of law. You cannot destroy democracy. So with this combination of uh, the basic structure, People's Court, the Supreme Court of India began to be recognized as the most powerful court in the world because of these developments. So from what happened in, during the emergency 75 to 77 and how the Supreme Court transformed itself into the People's Court and into the most powerful court in the world is I think a lesson that all of us must be proud of and we must try and remember and emulate. I believe that our Supreme Court can repeat this performance that has taken place in the 80s and 90s. Today, unfortunately, we are facing some kind of uh, a change in the sense that uh, a large number of constitutional cases have been lying in cold storage. Our present Chief Justice of India is making an effort to dig them out from cold storage but many, many of them have been lying in cold storage for years together, not being acted upon. And constitutionally important matters, it's not that 
you know, they are dealing with some interpretation of the constitution, but something very important which is going to affect the life of all of us. Freedom of speech is under threat. So people tweet, journalists write, they get arrested, accused of sedition and uh, put behind bars for months on end. Freedom of the press is being curtailed. We hear about uh, the media being, uh, you know, called a Godi media, uh, which is only talking one particular language and not talking the language of the people. The right to peaceful protest has uh, more or less gone. Uh, Section 144 of the CRPC has taken over. So the moment somebody wants to protest or some group of people want to protest, Section 144 is imposed and uh, you know they decide that you cannot have a protest. And if you are allowed to have a protest, the authorities will tell you where to protest. They will put barricades. If you don't, uh, if you jump over the barricades, you deal with water cannons, you deal with uh, tear gas shells and so on. Remember that the farmers were protesting for one year. They were not allowed to enter Delhi. It was a peaceful protest. They were not allowed to enter Delhi and eventually the Prime Minister said, all right, we'll take back the, uh, the, the three laws that they were protesting against. Today we are also fail, uh, faced with uh, the tenth schedule to the constitution which deals with the anti-defection law. <coughs> the tenth schedule is in a sense going through a shredder. You know, it, just about everything <coughs> which the tenth schedule wanted to do is now more or less gone. The Supreme Court has mentioned something called horse trading of MLAs, <coughs> where MLAs just shift from one party to another. Governments come, governments fall. Why? Because there is uh, horse trading. Why? Because the tenth schedule has gone through the shredder. Constitutional morality has been forgotten. Dr. Ambedkar talked a lot about constitutional mor morality, but it's been forgotten. Today we have, I'm sorry to say this, but we have some honorable governors who have forgotten about uh, constitutional morality. Maharashtra is one state where we had a problem. There are other states also where there are problems created by the honorable governors. The rule of law is being treated like a football by the executive. In some instances, anti-defection law, for example, some of the speakers have been criticized by the Supreme Court, not criticized, but they've been told by the Supreme Court that, listen, you have to take a decision. You can't keep uh, the decision pending for months together. The executive is now deciding what is the rule of law. So you have things like instant justice, you have things like bulldozer justice. These are the kind of you know, expressions uh, that are being used uh, to describe justice. So really we are living in uh, times which are very, very different uh, today than they were you know, over the last maybe 30 or 40 years, but perhaps tending towards the 1975-1977 era. What can the judiciary do? I think that is a question that all of us have to ask ourselves. The judiciary, I think, should remember that it has been described in, from the 1950s as the sentinel on the key weave. That is to say, it has to be alert to the violations of fundamental rights. I'm not talking about something happening now. I'm talking about judgments given by the Supreme Court in the 1950s, where they say that the Supreme Court is a sentinel on the key weave. The Supreme Court is the guardian of the Constitution. So if there's a violation of the fundamental rights of the citizens, of all of us, any one of us, the Supreme Court has to stand up and protect those fundamental rights. How can it do that? I think the Supreme Court has to be far, far more proactive than it has been in the recent past. We saw the Supreme Court not being active enough during the COVID. It's only when, you know, issues of uh, shortage of oxygen came up that some of the high courts and then later on the Supreme Court woke up and said that, you know, we can't have people dying because of uh, a shortage of oxygen. 
So the Supreme Court has to be far more proactive than it has been in the last uh, couple of years, maybe a little more. It must have, it must take suo modo action on various issues. As a judge of the Supreme Court, I had to deal with suo modo petitions. There was a letter sent by a former Chief Justice of India highlighting the plight of prisoners in the jails across the country. It was marked to me, I dealt with that case. It was on the basis of a letter sent by a former Chief Justice of India. I have had to deal with cases pertaining to widows in Vrindavan. Their plight, how they were you know, virtually turned into beggars, many of them coming from very good families, virtually turned into beggars. They were asked to sing bhajans in temples so that they could have breakfast, sing bhajans so that they can have lunch, sing bhajans so that they can have dinner. I've had to deal with so motor petitions with children, the rights of children under the uh, International uh, Convention and under the Juvenile Justice Act. So these are areas where I think the Supreme Court can make a difference by being the sentinel on the Kiwi, by being far more proactive than it has been, by taking so motor action on issues where the rights of people are being affected. We have talked about bail, not jail. Supreme Court has said that. But today, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming more like jail and not bail. It's not easy to get bail. And with some of these judgments that are coming out and uh, some of these laws that are being enacted, PMLA, I've mentioned, UAPA, sedition, it's difficult to get bail. And then you have uh, the National Security Act, where the question of a bail just doesn't even arise. Or you have the Public Safety Act, where the question of bail doesn't even arise. So really, these are tough times. And the Supreme Court and the judiciary as a whole must undertake this transformation that it took in the 1980s, for example, and protect the rights of citizens. I think th this is extremely important. Now, how can that be done? What we need, I believe, is a systemic change. We are, we've had this system going on for many, many years, but we now have to look at the change that has taken place over the years. Today, we, everybody's on WhatsApp, everybody's on social media, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on television. Not there 40 years ago, not there 50 years ago. We have to make that change. And that change can be a systemic change. I think the judges and the judiciary as a whole must introspect. Where are we going? Why are we going there? How are we going there? Are we going in the right direction? Do we need a change? And I think with that introspection, I have no doubt that the Supreme Court will be able to decide and the judiciary as a whole will be able to decide what to do. The challenges are known. What are the challenges that the judiciary as a whole is facing? They are known. It's not something which is you know, rocket science. Nobody knows what are the challenges. The judiciary knows that very well. But that introspection must be there. And once you are able to introspect, once you are able to identify the challenges, through that process of introspection, through that process of discussion and dialogue, it will be possible to bring about this change. We need to give primacy to the Constitution of India, not to the executive, not to executive actions. It is the Constitution of India that is governing all of us. We are in a sovereign, democratic, secular republic. And we have to make sure that we continue to be a sovereign, democratic, secular, socialist republic. That's a part of our preamble. We need to think out of the box because the challenges that were faced in the 1950s, the challenges that were faced in the 1960s, the challenges that were faced in the 1970s uh, during the emergency are different from the challenges that, are, that we are facing today. And I think the time has come for the Supreme Court to rise and shine and say that, well, 
We know what the problems are. We are prepared to think out of the box. We are prepared to take action. We are prepared to discuss everything. We are prepared to have a dialogue within ourselves and within, you know, with some experts who can advise them on what is happening so that this ivory tower business, you know, is, is, is a thing of the past. I think the Supreme Court has to realize that all of us, all the judges have to realize that all of us are still part of society, whether we are administrators or whether we are judges, whether we are politicians, whether we are the executive, we are all part of the same society. We are all part of the same country. I would like to uh, just mention what Dr. Rajendra Prasad said in his concluding uh, address to the Constituent Assembly on 26th November 1949. He was speaking about elected representatives, but I think this applies equally to all of us, including the judges. Dr. Rajendra Prasad said, if the people who are elected are capable and men of character and integrity, they would be able to make the best even of a defective constitution. If they are lacking in these, that is to say they are lacking in character and integrity, the constitution cannot help the country. After all, a constitution like a machine is a lifeless thing. It acquires life because of the men who control it and operate it. And India needs today nothing more than a set of honest men who will have the interest of the country before them. This is what Dr. Rajendra Prasad said on 26 November 1950. Put that, you know, I think it applies even today to elected representatives, but it also applies to a lot of other people. I had mentioned about honorable governors. Are they taking advantage of some lacuna or some loophole in uh, the constitution? What about the speakers of legislative assemblies? Are they taking advantage or lacuna in the 10th schedule to the constitution, in the implementation of the anti-defection law? What about words like horse trading? Can we accept that with regard to our elected representatives? Assuring the dignity of the individual and unity and integrity of India. This is what is expected of all of us, including the judiciary. I'm not saying that the judiciary has failed on these counts. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think once we look at this, at our constitution and the preamble, what Dr. Rajendra Prasad said, we have the answers to a whole lot of problems that are facing us today. I would like to mention about two challenges which are being spoken of a lot. The two challenges that are facing us today, facing the judiciary today, is the massive, massive pendency of cases. I will not dwell too long on that because uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it. But I'll just give you some figures. The total number of cases that are pending in the high courts and the district courts in India is about 48 million cases. The number of cases that are pending in the high courts and district courts in India, which are pending for more than 10 years, more than 10 years, is 46 lakh cases. Today, if a person files a case, the chances are that by the time the district court decides it, by the time the high court decides it, and by the time the Supreme Court decides it, probably half the adult life of that person will have gone. This is the massive pendency of cases that we have. There are many solutions, but unfortunately what has been happening is that we are resorting to ad hoc solutions. We have special courts, we have fast track courts, then we started having special fast track courts. Then we started having fast track special courts. I mean, the, the, these are just you know different words conveying the same meaning, 
but nothing really is happening on the ground. You have thousands, millions of cases that are pending and pending for years together. We have alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in place, enacted by parliament. We have mediation, we have conciliation, we have arbitration, we have judicial settlement. It's all a part of the civil procedure code. We have plea bargaining, a part of the penal code or the CRPC. We have the Probation of Offenders Act so that people don't have to spend years together in jail. <coughs> Today, it's something like 80%, between 75 and 80% of the persons in jail are under trial prisoners. So it's only maybe 20-25% of them are convicts. So you have all these mechanisms that are available. But to tackle the problem of pendency, you need a strong determination, you need a will, you need the energy. Once you have that, I have no doubt that even though we have 48 million cases pending, it may take some time, it may take two years, it may take three years, it may take five years, but it can be done. Dr. Mashelkar had mentioned in response to the question of uh, one of the uh, children who was here today, that you have to focus. So you focus on reducing the pendency. You will find ways and means of doing it. Not ad hoc solutions, not knee-jerk reactions. Oh, let's have a special code for uh, corruption. Let's have a special code for politicians. Let's have a special code for this or a fast track code for that. It, it doesn't work. These are areas where introspection is necessary. These are areas where you have to have institutions being built up which can tackle all these problems. I don't want to say anything more about uh, uh, dependency of cases because it's, it's a live problem. And I believe that if the Supreme Court shows this, or the judiciary shows this, uh, uh, you know, the will, determination, energy, if it rises and shines, this problem can be tackled. It is not, in my belief, it is not insurmountable. The more important area, I think, really is the appointment of judges. I think that has been extremely controversial in the recent past. The Supreme Court will uh, need to regain the turf. We have to realize that the independence of the judiciary is very, very important. We can't sacrifice the independence of the judiciary. There was a time when committed judiciary was being talked about. Today, we are talking about something called an executivized court, where decisions of the executive are difficult to set aside. People say that judges appoint judges, and India is the only country where judges appoint judges. I don't think that's correct. Judges only recommend judges. It is the government which appoints, it is the government which disappoints judges. It's not the judiciary. So we have, for example, 21% vacancies in the district courts across the country. More than 5,000 vacancies. When are we going to fill them up? There is a judgment of the Supreme Court of 2007 in the case of Malik Mazhar Sultan, which gives a calendar, which gives the dates that do this by 15th of January, do this by 28th of February, do this by 31st of March not being followed. If that judgment is followed, there won't be these 21% vacancies. We have the judgment of the Supreme Court that judicial education must be given to judges. Two years judicial education, not being followed. So judges are recruited, they start sitting in the court without judicial education, without social context uh, adjudication, and the quality of judgment suffers. High court, it's more or less the same situation. You have a very large number of vacancies in the high courts. In the recent past, something like 224 vacancies have been filled up, but you have still many, many more posts that are lying vacant. You have the government which is keeping recommendations in secret. You have a memorandum of procedure you have a judgment of the Supreme Court which says that within a particular time frame you must appoint judges not being followed. You have 
instances where the Supreme Court has said that, the Collegium of the Supreme Court has said that when we reiterate a name for appointment, you must accept it. But there are at least, at least 25 cases in the recent past where reiterations have been made twice, in some cases three times, appointments not been made for years on end. Recently, in February, we had a person who was recommended as a judge of a particular high court. He withdrew his consent. He said, I don't want to be a judge of the high court. Why? Because my case has been pending with you for the last one year. And you have appointed five persons who are far junior to me as judges. What happens to my seniority? There are instances where persons who have been recommended as appointment for appointment of judges they have lost 18 places of seniority. One person lost 18 places, one person lost 17 places. It has an impact on the future because that person has the potential, theoretically, to become a judge of the Supreme Court. But if there are 18 persons sitting above you, well, perhaps the chances are gone. If not the Supreme Court, that person has a chance of becoming a Chief Justice of a High Court and leading it in the right direction but the chance is gone. So you have this, you know, area where the appointment of judges has become a huge problem and that's a challenge which the courts must tackle. Should the appointment of judges remain entirely within the control of the uh, executive, which will decide whom to appoint, when to appoint, where to appoint, there is no criteria for holding back a file, there is no criteria for selection. Names are changed in the sense that the Supreme Court says in the Collegium recommendations that we are recommending A, B, C, D as 1, 2, 3, 4. The government picks up number 3 and says, alright, you know, we are going to appoint number 3, 1, 2 and 4 can wait. One of our former Chief Justices had written a letter and I will just quote what he says. He says, I don't approve of segregation of proposal without my knowledge and concurrence. In future, such a procedure of unilateral segregation should not be adopted by the executive. This was sometime in 2014, I think. Eight years have gone by, 2014-15, something like that. Eight, six, seven years, eight years have gone by. Segregation is happening and, you know, the courts are not bothered about it. And the executive says, well, you know, we will continue with the segregation. You know, it doesn't matter what your uh, Chief Justice says, but uh, we'll continue with it. That's where you lose the independence of the judiciary. And once you lose the independence of the judiciary, you're going to have a committed judiciary which was thought of during the emergency, around the time of the emergency, that we must have committed judges. So we are heading in that direction. And therefore, it is, I think, necessary for the courts to wake up, you know. That's why rise and shine. You have transfers taking place, arbitrary transfers. The executive says, we don't like a particular judgment, transfer this judge. And a high court judge is being transferred overnight. We had the situation in Delhi where during the riots, persons were not being allowed to go to hospital, injured persons. The judges took up the case, 11.30 at night there is a transfer order. What independence are we talking about? So these are, you know, areas where I think the Supreme Court must try and the judiciary as a whole must try to regain its turf. Because independence of the judiciary is very, very important. The preamble talks about justice, social, economic and political. How can we give it up? You know, we can't rewrite uh, the preamble to the constitution, which has been debated and discussed in the constitutional assembly by eminent, very, very eminent people. Independence of the judiciary, in my view, is absolutely vital. I think a democracy cannot survive if uh, the judiciary is not independent. We have to give up. Substitute instant justice, you know, where people are taking things in their own hands, lynching people, 
beating up people, whether it's the police, whether it's common citizens. You have bulldozer justice, which is now, you know, in uh, good measure. We have to substitute that with constitutional justice. And that can be done only by the judiciary. And the judiciary must show the way that we are governed by a rule of law, we are governed by a constitution, and we have to dispense constitutional justice, not bulldozer justice, not instant justice, and so on. The third thing, the last thing that I would like to say is that access to justice must be given the importance that it has always been given by the Supreme Court in the 1980s, 1990s. You have the poorest of the poor who could attend or who could file a case in the Supreme Court and have it heard on the basis of a postcard. Today we don't have postcards, at least I don't think we have postcards. But a small petition to the Supreme Court should be heard. It's the poor people who can't afford, you know, fancy lawyers who charge lakhs per day. It's these poor people who can't afford, you know, uh, internet connection. Education suffered during COVID. Why? Because people didn't have access to the internet. They don't have uh, computers. Poor people don't have computers. They can only send a letter to the uh, courts. Denial of bail has become endemic. Personal liberty is the most precious of all the rights that we have. Freedom of speech, yes. Freedom of press, yes. Freedom of movement, right to protest peacefully, yes. But personal liberty is what is important. You know, you can have all these rights and remain in jail. What's the use of these rights? So these are areas where I think, you know, the, 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 the courts have to be more alive to the requirements of the people. <coughs> we have to be sure that we can come back to the situation where our Supreme Court was known as the People's Court. Our judiciary was the People's Judiciary. Our Supreme Court was the strongest and the most powerful court in the world. It's possible. I believe it's possible. But we have to rise and shine. I would like to conclude by saying that uh, efforts are being made. Our present Chief Justice has a very short tenure, but he's like the opening batsman in a T20 match, you know, doing a lot of uh, changes. But I think we need, you know, a longer version of the game. And I hope his uh, successors will continue with the efforts that he has made. And, uh, you know, the time has come, I think, now to think about all these things, to come out of this, you know, hole that uh, we are finding uh, some of our judges in. We need to come out of this hole. We need to professionalize our justice delivery system. I would like to say that the 13th Finance Commission that was led by uh, Dr. Kilkar had come out with some brilliant ideas. Court managers, for example. Why can't we have court managers? You have hospital administrators. Why can't you have persons managing courts? He spoke about uh, judicial education. He spoke about uh, access to justice. He spoke about mediation. Why can't we do that? Let's, I think we should dig out the 13th Financial, uh, 13th Finance Commission report, look at it all over again and implement those ideas. I mean, there's no point in saying that, you know, we are giving the judiciary 10,000 crores, which is what has been given in the 14th Finance Commission, but it can't be utilized. 5,000 crores was given by the 13th Finance Commission. 18% was used, that's all. So, really, that change can be brought about. That change must be brought about. I think we can do it. I think the Supreme Court is realizing it. I think the judiciary is realizing it. And they are taking steps in the right direction. Our Chief Justice of India at the present moment is taking the courts in the right direction. I hope his successors will and I have no doubt that they will you know, follow his footsteps and continue with this. I would just like to end by saying that uh, the work that is being done by the Pune International Center, you call yourself uh, a think tank, but I think you're more of a think and action tank. 
right? Because many of your ideas are actually being put into action. I think that's what is needed. You know, perhaps the Pune International Center can continue with that guidance and we can have a far better judiciary uh, or a justice delivery system, not a judiciary. We have a good judiciary. We have a far better justice delivery system than we have today. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you very much. You concluded on a ray of hope and you spoke of the need uh, for India and for the judiciary to bring about a transformation, to bring about a systemic change, uh, to do some introspection on the state of the judiciary and the challenges that you spoke of, massive pendency of cases, appointment of judges and restoration of the independence of the judiciary. Uh, I would now like to open the floor to some questions. Just as local, we'll take some questions from the audience. We have microphones uh, on the floor. So if someone would like to ask questions, please raise your hands. Yeah, we have a... We have a um, Good evening, sir. It's an honor to be addressing you in person, the person who has been judge in the Supreme Court. Uh, I have a very uh, small question. When we are talking about peaceful and uh, there is, am I audible? Yeah. So when we are talking about peaceful protests. And there is a reasonable apprehension that the protest might turn violent. What should be the correct uh, executive action according to the judicial perspective? Yeah, actually, <coughs> uh, you know, it's really a decision that the police have to take. Uh, the judges can't do anything, the judiciary can't do anything if there's a protest going on. But, you know, the intelligence agencies get the information. It's not as if the police are unaware of what is happening. But uh, you see, what is also happening? Now, some states have taken up action and said that, oh, you know, if, if it's not a peaceful protest, if some building is being damaged or if some car is being burnt and all that, you pay for it. But at the same time, you know, this is where the question of equality comes in. There have been instances which you would have seen on television where the police themselves have destroyed, you know, uh, I have seen uh, a motorcycle being, you know, destroyed by the police. They just come with a lati, break the headlight of a person who is probably not even a protester. All right. A bill was sent in one of the states for the expense incurred by the police to quell a protest which may or may not have turned violent. One of the items on which the police asked for damages was shoes. They said that, you know, the police had to walk, so the shoes got worn out, so pay for those shoes. Now, you know, that, that's carrying things a little too far. So yes, protests do turn violent. Nobody supports, uh, you know, violent protests. But when the protest is peaceful, when you know it's going to be peaceful, when you have intelligence that it is going to be peaceful, I don't see why, you know, there should be a lati charge or a water cannon. But if there is intelligence that, yes, you know, the protest is going to be violent, I'm sure the police can talk to the people, the organizers of the protest, and say that, listen, just stay away from this violence. Because if you are violent, we will retaliate. So, but the judiciary does not come into it, you know. Uh, the judiciary will come into the picture only when, you know, something like this happens, where uh, there's damage to property, uh, you know, or where the police themselves, uh, you know, cause damage to property. That's where the judiciary will come in. We have a question from the back. 
Lordship, I have a couple of questions on independence of judiciary. Uh, our uh, ex CJI, uh, Mr. Justice Ranjan Gogoi, accepted Rajya Sabha nomination. Uh, does that compromise? Doesn't that compromise uh, independence of judiciary? One and second question, my lord. Uh, uh, there is lot of you know love jihad and whom to marry, what to eat. Uh, why can't Supreme Court take so much cognizance of, of that as well? You see, <clears throat> uh, something like post-retirement uh, assignments or jobs. You had mentioned a former Chief Justice. You know, th th this is where I keep remembering uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. I can tell you about uh, Chief Justice of India, Justice uh, Gajendra Gadkar. After retirement, he was appointed as the Vice Chancellor of Bombay University. Nobody said anything. Why? Because he was a person of integrity, he was a person of character. You've had Bombay High Court, Chief Justice Chagla. He was Education Minister in uh, Indira Gandhi's uh, cabinet. Yeah. And then later on, he was uh, India's High Commissioner. Nobody said anything. So when you have persons of character, when you have persons of integrity, it doesn't matter what they do. People will accept it. You know, but when you have somebody who is accused of uh, sexual harassment, uh, you know, getting a uh, nomination, people will ask questions. So, you know, th this really is, uh, you know, something which uh, Dr. Rajinal Prasad had hoped will not happen, but uh, we are seeing that, you know, somewhat gradual decline, which is unfortunate. It should not happen. And that's where, you know, issues of committed judiciary and all that come in. Because if we have a committed judiciary, we are heading in that direction, in my view. We are heading in that direction. You'll see the results after five years, ten years. On issues like, you know, love jihad and things like that, uh, I have already expressed that uh, the Supreme Court or the high courts should take suomoto action. So, yes, if there are instances of this nature, certainly they should, uh, you know, act. Namaste, sir. Namaste, sir. I would take this opportunity uh, as a student of law to say thank you for this uh, computerization of the courts. Uh, I searched on the net, I studied some articles that you were the part of e committee during 2016 2015. So, we are really thank uh, for the visionary or strategy towards the computerization as well as e-justice. Also, I would uh, likely thank to uh, PIC, Pune International Center for the uh, family to adding these important roots in the think tank as a justice and judicial system. Two important points that your views or some uh, computerization of the courts which really helped uh, during this COVID-19 that most of the cases which were on urgent priorities that had been held it through the uh, that had been held through the VC video conferences. Obviously, there are some positive side, there are some negative side. But as optimistic, I would really thank you that uh, digital justice that we are moving towards. It's really a great step. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Supreme Honorable Supreme Court as a people's court. Definitely, you uh, mentioned three important aspects. First one is the public interest litigation. Second uh, is access to justice and low adalat. So uh, today's my uh, question is about, or you, I wanted your expert views on the same. Can we combine uh, that? I am the witnessing that in low adalat, really, the burden of pending cases is uh, reduced at large. Most of the peoples they wanted some better relief and. Definitely, panel of Lok Adalat is giving them. So, can we combine that digital era? Can you keep it di short? Yeah, digital era uh, combination with the uh, Lok Adalat means can we go with? The, I want your yeah, views yeah. about the digital yeah. era and Lok Adalat. Yeah, it's 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 possible. It's it's very much possible. Uh, you know, we've gone a step further. Uh, we had inaugurated something called a virtual court. And uh, in Pune, it was tried out. In Pune, it was tried out. It, it functioned very well. But uh, for some reason, 
Maharashtra has not picked it up, Delhi picked it up. The idea of a virtual court is that we tried it out for uh, traffic offenses. All right. It comes out on in that virtual court. And you have the option to plead guilty or plead not guilty. If you plead guilty, you know, uh, you pay the fine. And we had kept it at the minimum fine. And the case is closed. If you plead not guilty, the matter goes to court. Now, <clears throat> if you have one computer, right, which says that, uh, you know, this is uh, the traffic chalan that has been issued to such and such person, such and such uh, vehicle number, such and such driving license number, that one computer can handle the entire state. The entire state of Maharashtra can be handled by one computer. All right. So this is an innovation that has taken place with uh, the use of computers to have a virtual court and it can be extended to a lot of other petty offenses, uh, you know, delay in payment of uh, property tax, for example. All right. You have to pay some interest. Why does somebody have to go to court to challenge it or why does somebody have to file a case, the municipal authorities to uh, try and recover that money? It can be done through... Uh, virtual courts. So the idea is to marry technology with petty cases like local dalits. It's possible. And an extension of that, which is already going on at, actually at the moment, is these virtual courts where, you know, petty offenses like traffic offenses, house tax, property tax, you know, these kind of things can all be taken care of. So it's, it's possible. It is being done. And uh, the initiative started from here, from Pune. And uh, for some reason, I, I don't know, uh, it has not been carried forward. But that can make a huge, huge change so far as a large number of uh, petty cases are concerned. Sir, Sir. Uh, access to irreproachable justice by using artificial intelligence. What are your, your views? And secondly, we have to strengthen our lower judiciary first. Because the first point of contact for the people at large is lower judiciary. Many people are hardly going to hard, high court or supreme court. So we have to strengthen first lower judiciary. Yeah, yeah you're right. I agree with you that uh, the lower judiciary or the district judiciary uh, must be strengthened. That's why I mentioned that, you know, 21% vacancies. That's, we're talking about 5,000 vacancies. Why should they exist? And in the case of Malik Mazhar Sultan 2007, Supreme Court has given a calendar that advertisement should come on such and such date, examination should be held on such and such date, results should be announced on such and such date, interview on such and such date. You know on 1st of January how many people are going to retire. Put their vacancies, advertise their vacancies. So it's really, I mean, the Supreme Court is dealing with something like 70,000 cases. Important, yes, but nothing compared to, you know, 42 million that are pending in uh, the district courts. So, yes, it, they, it has to be strengthened. There's no doubt about it. Nobody has a second opinion on that. About artificial intelligence, you know, artificial intelligence has not actually worked for judgment uh, delivery. You know, you can get pretty close to it. For example, uh, you know, but you need a lot of data. Okay, for, I'll, I'll give you uh, an example of a traffic offense. Uh, a person jumps the traffic light. How many times has he committed this offense or a similar offense? What is the age of that person? What was the speed? You know, all that data, if that is put in and across the country, then you will know that the fine should be in the region of 100 rupees, between 100 and 150 rupees. All right. If a person uh, does something more serious than jumping a traffic light, then the fine should be in the region of 500 rupees to 560 rupees or 600 rupees. So artificial intelligence can actually work through machine learning. But to take a decision on whether the person should be given five-year sentence or six-year sentence, no computer can tell you that. We will take one one last question before we pass it to your friend, uh, the gentleman there. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have two uh, questions. One is actually confusion. 
the confusion is that uh, uh, when i read about jalikattu or shahabanu cases when my mind thinking uh, is it their supreme from the verdict is uh, uh, they can uh, just cross nullify the verdict is it the power uh, uh, with the executors and second question is that why so much fees like if we say harish salve's fees or ram jet malani's fees why so much money in it means what is the reason it is so high there is a confusion sir that's it for the second uh, question i have no answer uh, probably the gentleman that you have mentioned only they can answer why they charge such fees but that's where access to justice becomes important right so that the poor person can also get the best assistance that is the purpose of free legal aid which is a part of uh, the directive principles of uh, state policy on your first question about you know the executive nullifying uh, judgments of the supreme court you know the law is that if you take away the basis of the judgment of the supreme court it can be done but by parliament not by the executive it can be done only by parliament but if you can, if you do not take away the basis you know on uh, the basis on which the judgment uh, has been delivered even parliament can't do that they can't say that well you know we just overrule this judgment they can't do it and there have been instances uh, particularly with regard to electoral laws where the parliament has said you know we don't agree with the supreme court and we enact a different law supreme court has said you can't do it you know because you have the reason that we have given unless you get rid of that reason you can't just nullify a judgment otherwise there'll be utter chaos you know thank you very much assistant i shall go back to you thank you everyone before we proceed i would now would like to request dr kerkor to present pic's first book rising to the china challenge as a token of appreciation to our chief guest please give a big round of applause for this man <laughs> Thank you everyone. As we move towards the end of our program, I would like to invite Dr. Kerkor to give his concluding remarks. Our distinguished chief guest uh, honorable justice Lokur Shrimati Lokur Dr. Mashil Kar, trustees of PIC, members of PIC, and our distinguished guests. Uh, when I saw the title of your lecture, Rise and Shine, it reminded me of the uh, Vivekananda's clearing call to be awakened by it. And I think your lecture was indeed a mysterious spirit of clearing call to our judiciary for improving, not just judiciary, but quality of life and quality of democracy for all of us. And uh, I hope that uh, it will be studied and practiced carefully by you. fraternity our judicial fraternity but this is important because uh, you said it very eloquently i may not be as eloquent as you are but i think we are going in very very difficult times and our challenges are democracy facing are quite quite severe so uh, i'm really grateful on behalf of all of us i thank you for not just outlining the problem we face but also solutions and i hope that this that is it you made a very kind remark for psc that uh, it is not a thing to a thing in act time but sir the reason we are more doing that because i think we see the current tendency in the government act and then think so we don't sort of promote more different sequence that uh, and then that so that's the reason we what we will 
also helping people to think and act. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, I don't want to sort of uh, the, make any other comments because you just said that I'm still absorbing it, what you said. But it was one of the most remarkable lectures I've heard in many, many days or months, which really outlined outline the challenge, existing challenge for democracy. So uh, I'm very deeply grateful to Justice Lukur for you coming here, accepting our invitation, and also accepting our request to become honorary member. It means a lot to us because, as Dr. Marshall has mentioned, we were remiss in not having a single distinguished jurist as our honorary member. So I want to thank you once again from all of us. And uh, <coughs> now I hand back to our. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kedra. As we conclude today's event, on behalf of Pune International Centre, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to our Honourable Chief Guest, Justice Lokur and his wife, Mrs. Lokur, for gracing the event. I would also like to thank our President, Dr. Masherkar, Vice President, Dr. Kirkar, Director of Harvaidya, RPIC Trustees, Members, and all the entire team of Pune International Centre for their timely support and enthusiasm. I would also like to thank Gyanki for helping us organize the Abhinav Sparta, Yashada for helping us host the event, Foundation Day event here, and the entire media team who has joined us today. Last but not the least, a big, big thank you to our lovely audience. You've been extremely encouraging. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.